Um, we're, we're all trained how to be modern 21st century humans. You know, our, our parents teach us, the television teaches us, the internet teaches us what is expected of us, what is normal, you know, what's a cool person, what's a successful person. That's all pretty clearly spelled out. And it's way different than the answers to those questions in Botswana land in 100 BC or, 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 or Goa in 1694, you know? Hi, everyone. Welcome back to The Soul Collective. It is an extraordinary honor to introduce today's guest to the show, the one and only Stephen Forrest, who is an evolutionary astrologer. Stephen is the author of a dozen astrological books, including the classic The Inner Sky. His work has been translated into many languages, and over the years, he has traveled the world teaching his brand of evolutionary astrology, an astrology which features and integrates free will, grounded humanistic psychology, and ancient metaphysics. Currently, he leads an online school, the Forest Center for Evolutionary Astrology. Stephen, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yes. So one of the questions that I'd love to ask you first, and I ask many, many guests, is what are some of the astro placements in your chart that you would say, you know, lend to the work that you're doing in the world today? Well, probably the deepest one of all is the south node of the moon. And a lot of people might not even have heard of that. To me, it's maybe the most uh, telling point in anybody's birth chart. Uh, I, I think of it in terms of reincarnation. Um, it, it's your your karma, and uh, uh, not everybody is comfy with that idea. I bet you are. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> um, a, a, you, a baby is born, and you look into the kid's eyes, and the kid is one minute old, and there's somebody home, and there's somebody in there, which raises the question: How did that? person get in there that that does improve reincarnation but it kind of gets us in the mood of the south node now now mine my own south node is in the the mystical woo woo 12th house uh -huh. in, in the spooky intense sign scorpio uh -huh. and, and so uh all my instincts uh right, right from childhood were uh it drew me in the direction of what what used to be called the occult. That that word I think is uh, is fading a little bit. It's unnecessarily spooky, but the idea that uh, that these bodies are are not our true nature. That uh, it's a, a bit of a bumper sticker here, but we're not uh, physical beings having spiritual experiences, but rather spiritual beings having a physical experience. Uh, it's it's uh, again a familiar line you find it on a coffee mug probably, but but it really does say it, and uh, that's the heart of the work that I do. It's the heart of my own chart, and the two are inseparable. Yeah, I love that so much. So what would you do you think that there's any indicators that would lend to somebody being uh, an astrologer? Uh, yes, uh, nothing, nothing definitive. Uh, uh, that's an important point. I can't look at anybody's chart and say, you need to be an astrologer or a lawyer or a dog catcher. You know, we interact creatively and unpredictably with their charts. That, that's, that's the heart of the matter as far as I'm concerned. I'm not a determinist, I'm not a fatalist, I'm not a fortune teller. But uh, to, to be an astrologer, obviously a certain interest in inner affairs, psychology and all that is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, to be a professional astrologer, you, you've got to have a lot of love in your heart. And uh, again, I, I know that might sound like a cliche, but but the reality is uh, you're, you're dealing with human tragedy uh, often, you know, sometimes every day and tragedies tend to be repetitive. And, and if the client sits down with you and they say, this is the 17th divorce I've dealt with this month. Can't we talk about something else? You know, there, there, there's not enough love. You, you've got to care about people. Um, to be an astrologer, you need strong verbal skills, which are easily indicated in a chart, Mercury, Gemini, third house kinds of things, technically, they've got to be there. You can have all the love in the world, but if you can't talk, you can't build the bridge to people. 
Uh, a third point I would make after love and verbal skill, uh, the third and final point, um, is less true now than it used to be. But a certain thick skin, you know, is helpful <laughs> because uh, astrologers are often mocked. You know, the, the the media view of astrology is becoming more favorable. We are winning the battle, you know, and uh, that's why I was born is, uh, is partly to fight that battle. And we are getting ahead. Astrology is a lot more accept, uh, accepted than it used to be, but there's still a certain, my God, you're an astrologer, you know, and uh, we, we, you just have to water off the duck's back is uh, so a certain thickness of skin is helpful there too, I think. Yeah, that makes so much sense. You know, I often say that astrology has been such a profound healing modality in my life because it's helped me to really understand parts of myself and appreciate some gifts and also, you know, challenging aspects and also have a better sense of what I'm here to learn and to teach. And I'd love to hear from your perspective, you know, why you think astrology can be so healing and also you know, how would you characterize in your own words what evolutionary astrology is? Yeah, so, um, you quoted my words about that latter question right at the beginning. It is the, the synthesis of, uh, of modern psychology and ancient metaphysics. You know, that's evolutionary astrology. Uh, a uh, psychologist will uh, explore the various traumas and difficulties of your childhood, and, and develop insights into your present life and adult life. And that can be incredibly helpful. Um, with uh, evolutionary astrology, uh, we would accept that and include that way of thinking, but we would also think of the childhood of the soul, the uh, uh, unresolved karma, who, what brought you here? You, you have this chart for, for a reason, it's, it, it's purposeful. And, uh, uh, so it's that, that's really that point of, of, of synthesis. It hit me again with the first part of your question. I got swept away into the second part. Yeah. Why, why is it such a, a profound healing modality? Mm, yeah, that's, um, that brings us right to the heart of the matter. Um, we're, we're all trained how to be modern 21st century humans. You know, our, our parents teach us, the television teaches us, the internet teaches us what is expected of us, what is normal, you know, what's a cool person, what's a successful person. That's all pretty clearly spelled out. And it's way different than the answers to those questions in Botswana land in 100 BC or, 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 or Goa in 1694, you know. Um, so we have our soul nature, and it exists in some degree of tension with social training and social expectation. The, the more those outward things win, the crazier we become because we're estranged from our own soul. And then astrology comes in and reminds you of who you are. It reminds you of who you are. It leads me to one of my favorite lines, gets me in trouble with my colleagues sometimes, but nobody needs astrology. You, you can do fine without astrology. There are other ways people can know themselves, but uh, you know, why not use astrology too? You know, it holds the mirror of truth before you and there's nothing more healing than that. Let me take it one step further so it's, it's as clear as it can be. Um, as... Uh, modern uh, denizen of the United States, you know, uh, especially with my white paint job and, you know, all of this <laughs> relatively middle class background. Um, I, I'm, I have always since I was born been under pressure to identify myself by my career. You know, that's just built into the water we drink, you know, in, in the modern uh, industrialized, you know, digital age world. Basically, everybody used to be just the men, now the women too, you know, people of color. Everybody is shamed if they haven't made money, made noise, shamed for not having planets in the 10th house. <laughs> that was the astrological translation, and that's the house of career and your status in the world. Um, but you know, some of us don't have planets there, and and so astrology teaches us to 
honor the fact that there might be somebody who's not really supposed to be thinking in terms of career. They're all about family, or they're all about their spiritual life, or they're all about their creative life. Even if their book never gets published, they still learn something from their creative life. And the beauty of astrology is we can discern that and honor that and liberate people, uh, if they're willing to listen, from the social expectations on them to distort themselves and pretend to be something they're not. That's so well said. It makes me want to cry because it's just such a, a beautiful and profound way of looking at it. And, you know, it's, it's funny because I feel like, you know, oftentimes we want to look at the, you know, se sexy aspects and the, the 10th house or, you know, yeah. um, what have you, but um, I, I love how you describe the birth chart as a map of the soul. And one question that I have for you is really how much insight do you think that we can discern from looking at a, a birth chart in terms of past lives? It's a slippery question. Uh, quite a lot, you know, would be the short answer. Um, let's just, just postulate that, uh, uh, a person saved every penny and sold everything they had to buy a ticket on a leaky ship and cross the ocean and come to the new world and start a new life. But the ship sank in the middle of the ocean. You know, just just the story. I, I, it's funny how we both smile because obviously a tragedy. You're not smiling if you're that person. But that kind of thing happens. And let's say that's the the facts of a prior life. Now, what we're going to see in the chart, we'll probably see some reference to, to extreme situations, uh, uh, cultural dislocation, maybe some travel symbolism. Uh, we're probably going to see some element of tragedy. Uh, Pluto squares that south node of the moon, you know, for, for, for one example. And, and from that, we'll, we'll tell a story. Now, if I were looking at that chart, and I didn't know the reality of, of the person drowning in the Atlantic Ocean or something, I might look at it and tell a story about you were on a, a wagon train, you know, heading, heading from Ohio to down the Oregon Trail in 1861 or something, and, uh, and, and starving, angry Comanches attacked you and you didn't make it, you know, your bones are out there in Kansas, you know, somewhere. Now, that story is wrong if we have a literal mind, if we're only thinking of facts, you know, you actually drowned in the ocean, uh, but it's emotionally right. And, yes. and that, that's what we can see. And then I take that one step further. Um, if you had kind of spiritually dealt with that tragedy, it would not appear in your present chart. You know, it's like you're, it's unresolved karma. You're, you're, it's ripened, you're ready to deal with it. Yes. In this Doesn't mean you will, but it means you're ready to and you're supposed to. And, and then I tell the story, you, you were on the wagon train and the hungry Comanches, you know, uh, killed you before you could get to your destination. And it's not true, but it rings the bell in the heart. You know, the story, reminds the person of, of what actually happened. Or they might not remember, I don't know, but the work is emotional. Yes. One more, if you'll forgive me, because I, I, you, you can see I'm excited about this stuff. Among people who accept reincarnation, if we're sitting around talking about our past lives, you know, we got some, you know, kind of memories, you know, some vague impressions. There's a place we saw and it was gave us goosebumps, you know, everybody's got some stories like that. But the simple fact we, we forget our past lives, you know, in practical terms, if I say what was your name, you know, who knows, you know, uh, at the mercury level, mental memory, factual memory, the trauma of death and rebirth erases the, the, the uh, hard drive, so to speak, or the random access memory. But at the level of the moon, the moon memories, the memories of the heart, they are robust and they survive the trauma of death and rebirth. So we do not remember our past lives, but we remember what they felt like. And the trauma is stored in the south node of the moon, the moon, the feeling reference, the past of the heart, 
not of the intellect. That's, uh, I'm probably being too windy here, but this gets us into the, the technical logic behind evolutionary astrology. I love that. And I love how you say if it's emotionally right, it can be extraordinarily healing. I think it is yeah. that emotional yeah. content that we connect with and that resonates that can provide such a sense of release. It's all about stories. Yes, yes. I feel like there has to be some level or combination of intuition. I don't know, maybe it's that north node in the the twelfth house, but you know that that helps to really feel the story that that accompanies a chart. Yeah, exactly. Intuition plays a, a big role in, in astrology. It's a, it's a kind of a delicate area, you know, like uh, sometimes I do, do a session with somebody and they, they love the work, but they kind of don't want to get labeled as somebody who believes in astrology. They're in, the, in that kind of situation. So they're, they're, it's a tough spot for them. And, the, and they'll look at me with this conspiratorial gleam in their eye and they'll say, you're pretty psychic, aren't you? You know, and, and <laughs> I can see the trap, you know, it's like if, if I say, yeah, I am, then they, they don't have to believe in astrology. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't want to fall into that trap. And yet there are intuitive and even uh, psychic is kind of an extreme word, but every astrologer sooner or later, something's going to come out of your mouth. And it's like, where did that come from? You know, it's, it's, it's so, so, so specific. Yeah. Uh, that happens. And, and yet there's a science to it, you know, and, and that's, I, I want to make sure that doesn't get lost and, and simple proof of it. Um, I, I've, I've written uh, computerized reports, you know, that, that uh, where the, the machine will do the reading. I'm, I'm right now I'm involved with a, a project called Leela. Uh, uh, we're creating yes. a, a cell phone app. You know, I'm happy to talk about that too. And it's basically the same thing, just the computers we all have in our pockets now. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the point is that works, you know, and we, we take the human piece out of it entirely. It's a machine, you know, using the science of astrology and it can be helpful. I, I quickly say it's half what we can do if we actually sit with the person, but that half is pretty helpful. Yeah, that's a great point. I'd love to talk about the science of the nodes and also the evolutionary work of moving from the South node to the North node and sure. what that looks like of integration. Yeah, it says, well, um, there's an astrologer um, in New York City named Michael Luton, and uh, he, he just nailed this. A uh, person has to know a little bit about 12-step programs, you know, for, for, for this metaphor to make much sense. But Michael once said, the South Node is the bottle and the North Node is the meeting. You know, if you're trying to beat your addiction to alcohol, that whiskey is really tempting, but you know, you should go to the meeting and it's going to be good for you. Nothing could feel more natural and habitual than drinking the whiskey or repeating your South Node patterns because they're so deeply ingrained. But the North Node is the shock that we can deliver to that South Node and, and break us out of the pattern. Okay. I love that. I wonder if you would indulge, uh, you know, an example of this and selfishly, um, you know, my North node is in the 10th house in the sign of Gemini. And I also have Chiron on the mid heaven at, at two degrees yes. in the sign of Gemini. Um, so I'd love to know that. And I have a stellium in the fourth house. Um, so Near that if, node. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's a, that's a mouthful. Well, let me dive in. Uh, so uh, can, can I ask you one more chart question before I, I dive in? Uh, Jupiter is the ruler of the south node and that becomes an important piece of the puzzle. Where's your Jupiter? It's right on the south node. Ah, okay, <laughs> in Sagittarius. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, remember I'm telling a story here. I'm yeah. pretty confident about what I'm gonna do, but if facts, who knows? But truth, that's a little different. So uh, we have, uh, I always like to start with the South Node, like, you know, what's holding you back? What, what's the what's the past? And and here we have uh, uh, the fourth house, which, uh, I mean, take the universe divided into 12 boxes. You know, they're big boxes, but, yeah. but a, a good place to start with the fourth house is the eternal human reality of family with all its joys and entanglements and so on. With the South Node, we're always biased a bit negative. And so the idea of you in a prior life 
being very much defined by your family mm. and the, the, the sense uh, with Jupiter, ruler of Sagittarius, so it's a very pure, very powerful expression of that energy. Jupiter, the Roman king of the gods. So your family in the prior life was probably uh, prestigious, prosperous. I, I think you were born into a rich family. Now, now if, if we're really dumb, we think born into a rich family, thumbs up, you know? <laughs> But let's think a little more suspiciously. Are, are there dangers, you know, connected with the expectations, the scripted life uh, of, of being defined by the family and not able to really blossom as an individual? The fourth house where your self node lies is, uh, is basically straight down. Uh, that's the simplest way to think about it. And, and so the idea of something buried. And what do we bury? We bury treasure. We bury bones. You know, we, 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 and so the sense of you buried in a prior lifetime. Uh, I could say more if we added the rest of the planets there, but that gives us a sense of it. And, and danger of repeating that in this lifetime. But how do you not repeat it? What is the shock that you uh, have been born to deliver to your consciousness? Gemini, North Node, 10th house. And there we have the idea of the public. We spoke of the 10th house earlier. Career is one word for it. The word I like to use here is mission, that you have a mission in this world. And, and the notion is to come out of hiding and reveal yourself, you know, fourth house to 10th house, revelation, how? Well, it's in Gemini with your mouth open, with a microphone and headphones on, you know, and, and people looking at you. You are uh, to be a teacher. You have something to, to say in this lifetime. You mentioned Chiron on, on the midheaven. Is, is that in Gemini or Taurus? It's in uh, Gemini. In Gemini, okay, so we're the, you're, you're helpful here, you're keeping it fairly simple. And, and so Chiron, um, the wounded healer. And, uh, and so if a person, or oh, just use a strong image here, a person is addicted to heroin, let's say, and, and they beat it, you know, they, they go through that hell and they beat it, and they're not addicted any longer. That's somebody who can help other people who are addicted to heroin. That's somebody who's going to understand the problem because they've been there and they found their way out of it. They'll understand it better than anybody else. That's Chiron, the wounded healer, the way we can take our wounds and turn them into gifts for other people. So what's your wound? Sagittarian fourth house stuff that I won't repeat it. And how do you Use your voice to empower people to break out of their familial and cultural training and, and find their own voices. You know, there, there it is in a nutshell. How does that sound? So beautiful. Wow. Thank you so much for that. Um, oh, profound. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you if you plan on writing a book on Chiron. Oh, good question. I, it's, it's, uh, it's not a not a plan at this point, but it is something I would very much like to do. I, uh, the the universe uh, seems to want it. I I do webinars, you know, technical teaching, and um, usually I'll, I'll do pretty well. Maybe get three hundred people sign up, you know, for a webinar. I did one about Chiron a year or so ago. We had eleven hundred people, so I, you know, <laughs> there, there seems to be some desire for it. Uh, uh, I'd like to do it. I'm, I'm very, very busy, uh, as you might imagine, with uh, all sorts of projects. Uh, I, I, I'm seeing fewer clients than, than I used to by far to make time for legacy work as I get older. I'm you know, thinking more in terms of, of, of keeping the flame burning after I'm, I'm gone. Uh, and uh, writing more books is, is definitely part of that. I just finished the... Uh, Elements series, you know, four four books, almost two thousand pages. I wow. I set out to write down everything I knew basically about astrology, and I got that project done. and And you mentioned my school, the Forest Center for Evolutionary Astrology, forestastrology dot center for anybody interested. Awesome. And uh, what what we're doing there is uh, it's a pretty rigorous, almost like a college course, you know, start at zero and, and learn to do this kind of astrology. We, we call it a, a trade school for the soul. 
and uh, obviously this is a bit of product placement, but I, I'm, I'm also, uh, it's very much part of what I, I feel the purpose of my life is at, at this stage, you know, to legacy work, to pass it on. The, the cell phone app that we're working on is kind of connected to that. It's more a way of reaching out to a broader audience and giving them a little taste of this kind of astrology rather than you're a Gemini, so you talk too much, or you're a Scorpio, so you're sexy. You know, we just we just want to go deeper than that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd love to dive in and, and talk with you a little bit more about the dating app that you are um, working on right now. And, you know, I have your book, Skymates. It's a wonderful book and really dives into, you know, astrology and relationships. And so I guess one question that I have for you is, you know, when you look at two birth charts, do you ever say, you know, these two individuals are, you know, doomed in a relationship or vice versa, you know, they have a lot of um, indicators for success. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm never, never would I say thumbs up or thumbs down. Again, I'm just not a fatalistic astrologer. And some of that's philosophy, but a lot of it is experience. Uh, I, I have seen relationships that that looked impossible by the old astrological standards work really well. You know, uh, there, there's more negotiation naturally. If you're really different from each other, you have to negotiate. But if you negotiate successfully, you're closer. You know, there's a sense of intimate process. You're learning. It may be a struggle, but you're learning. There's more passion in it. And, and so that can head south, but it can also head north. And, mm -hmm. and then the, the classic kind of you know, marriage made in heaven, it's all trines and sextiles and Capricorn should marry Tauruses, you know, and that, that kind of stuff. Um, it can work. It, it can work. It, it has a friendly, natural feeling, but I can also get really sleepy. Mm. And so a couple breaks up and um, there's a lot of different versions of that, of course, but, but how often have you heard this? Uh, you have an intimate talk with one of the people as they're breaking up a, a friend and and you and and he or she says something was missing you know yeah. just that, that classic line something was missing and uh what's what's the something you know and and that's something a, a, a foolish person will think sex right away and they're not entirely incorrect but but uh um the passion isn't so much somebody looks really cute, you know, after a while, it's, it's got to be deeper than that. And there's a, a gritty sense of engagement with each other, you know, at a soul level, it, it correlates with sex, but it's not just sex. And, and, and the interesting thing that I've discovered is, is that a lot of that, that grittier sense of process that really connects people with each other comes more from things that were traditionally viewed as negative or bad between people than, than the sleepy, oh, sweet, we, we agree about everything. We, we don't even need to talk. You know, after a while, a tradition of not needing to talk begins to take a toll. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't this sound like common sense, you know, in the modern world, you know, it just seems like I'm saying obvious things, you know, people reflect will come to similar conclusions. And, and I'm, I'm just, I've always been trying to reconcile astrology with the way the world is today. Yeah. And so different from the way it used to be. I see. Yeah. I'm, I'm so curious about ask, like, are there certain aspects that you would look at um, as, you know, particularly positive in terms of, you know, challenging aspects in a relationship that might, you know, allow for two individuals to really have a lot of growth in their relationship. I, I'm sure that there are many. Yeah, well, you know, the, it's uh, I, I, I sort of echo the idea that I'm, I'm never that deterministic, like here's, oh, you have this lucky aspect, you know, your marriage is bound to work. But the one principle I have found that's, that's kind of like that, in, in, at least in, down that same road, is... Uh, the thing that would scare me the most, you know, we're getting married, look at our charts, you know, oh, oh my God. The thing I don't want to see is a lack of aspects between the two. I'd much rather see nothing but hard aspects than to see no aspects at all. Interesting. So the, 
the, the reality of this, this will sound cruel, but you know, as we as we go through life, how, how many thousands and thousands of human beings do we see? You know, like with our eyes, you know, in the grocery store or whatever, and. And almost everybody out there might as well be a potted plant, you know, as far as we're concerned, you know, <laughs> again, not to dismiss people, but we're, we're just not connected. We have nothing to say. We're not engaged. And and that's all right. They are they're engaged with other people. And and the lack of aspects produces that that feeling of just not having a common language mm-hmm. now to are lonely to people kind of hooked on how how people look you know material superficialities add a little loneliness add a little opportunity they wind up in bed together you know it, it happens and but you know it's like i i can i hope i'm not being too x-rated here but say they, <laughs> they they make love you know or have sex and and uh because they're both hungry and the body is hungry and the heart is hungry and, and then the telling moment, afterwards, they're, they're kind of polite, <laughs> you know, formal with each other, you know, thank you for the lovely evening. <laughs> and, you know, that's because there isn't that juice. And, and then we could imagine a, almost exactly the same situation. Superficially, two people meet, one thing leads to the next with unseemly speed, and, and they fall asleep in each other's arms, you know. There's that that feeling of of comfort and connection. Uh, they don't know each other very well, but the instinctual energetic bond is there, and we can see that astrologically. And it's from aspects, and we, we can see the absence of it, and that's from the lack of aspects. Yeah. Do you look at the vertex in in terms of romantic connections? No, I'm not saying we shouldn't. Uh, I, I fooled with the vertex a little bit, probably 30 or 40 years ago, and and uh, I sort of I felt like I was understanding it, but I, it, it never really became integrated into my work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One question I have for you is about twins. Have you ever read twins' uh, birth charts and the phenomenon of them, you know, being so different in the world? Yeah, it's uh, it's again one of my favorite areas, you know, because uh, deterministic astrologers, you know, this is your chart, so this is how you're going to be. They hate talking about twins because, as you say, countless stories of twins, and they're so different, you know. So wait a minute, their charts are the same, but they're different. The whole, you know, let can we change the subject, you know? Uh, and I say no, let's embrace the subject because that's part of the truth. How you respond to your chart is not determined by your chart. You're in a partnership with your chart. Your chart asks you questions. It's your fate to hear certain questions in this lifetime, but how you answer them is up to you. And so these twins are same chart, but different souls, and they're gonna respond differently. And that's really the heart of the matter. I I would also add that uh, it, it would be very unusual for twins to be born at the same second you know, for, for obvious reasons. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the even fairly subtle differences in time can make a significant difference. Uh, one one is, is a really simple story. The, these oh, the clients of mine, oh, we love your work, but these two guys, they're as different as night and day. You know, they're twins. Yeah. Look at their charts. They're born like seven or eight minutes apart. And one of them uh, was born before the sun rose, the other one after the sun rose. Sun in the first house, sun in the 12th house, just yeah. seven or eight minutes. But they were literally as different as night and day. So we always have to look for that too. Yeah, that's a great example. I am a twin, actually, and we're a minute apart. And oh, very much have- alike. Yeah, no, we were very different, but I can also see how, you know, the different aspects of our charts have manifested in their own way, in their own unique way in our lives, you know? Yes, you're different souls, and yeah. that's really the heart of it. There's also, a, and this is pure psychology, but twins uh, are, are, are often dressed alike, you know, and under a lot of pressure to be the same and interchangeable, and there's a natural rebellion against that, you know? Totally. Most- so, so kids or twins will uh, will often uh, divide up the chart. It's like you do the Mars and I'll do the Mercury, which is is not necessarily good for either of them because you know you've got to look at the whole chart. Or or even scarier, I'll do good Mars and you do bad Mars. <laughs> 
you know, the, this, this urge to individuate yes. it, it operates within the, the astrological context, but taking them down different roads of expression with the chart. Yeah. Stephen, you mentioned your school, and I'd love to know, you know, if people are really looking to deepen their connection with astrology, where would you recommend that they get started? Well, it depends how serious they are. If, if somebody is uh, interested in, in like reading a book and learning the basic language of astrology, uh, I'd recommend my first book, The Inner Sky. And uh, that one, oh, there you go. Okay, great. Yeah, came out with Bantam and Oh gosh, 40 years ago now almost. And, but uh, that's, it's like a, a primer. It, it teaches you the basic language. I, I wrote it for uh, serious, intelligent, total beginners. You know, mm -hmm. that, that was basically the market I, I was aimed at. Um, if somebody gets their feet wet and they really want to learn how to do astrology, especially if they uh, may be a younger person thinking this, this could be my career, you know? And uh, wow, I... I love I love it when I see that, and I, I really like to emphasize that this can be a career. You know, you you can uh, if you get good at this, build build a practice. You're skillful, and word gets out. You know, you can make an income uh, like a like a psychotherapist. You know, for example, you know, it's a, you're you're not going to be Jeff Bezos, but you know, you you can have a middle class. And very meaningful life, you know. And I really like to to beat that drum, and that's that leads me to the the school, the FCEA, the Forest Center for Evolutionary Astrology. I mentioned it earlier, and uh, basically we we start off with uh, absolute fundamentals. Uh, 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 if a person knew nothing, you know, they, they could enter the school, and actually the the first courses are based on the inner sky, and we we kind of go through it step by step, and hold their hands. And I've recorded uh, about 200 videos, instructional videos so far, you know, it's been a, a big job. Yeah. And, uh, and so we're, we're just, uh, we're trying to turn out professional level evolutionary astrologers. So. Love that. What is on the horizon for you that you're most excited about? Oh, well, let's see, you know, if, um, if the cell phone app Leela really takes off, and I, I have a feeling it's it's going to. That'll free me to do a lot of writing, you know. At at, at this stage, you know, I, I I do a fair number of astrological readings. That's been really most of my income, and I, I never want to stop that. But I I would really like to re reduce the amount of client work I'm doing, so I had more time to write and and really to actively teach. And I, I say writing, I'm an old guy, I think of books, you know, but now of course, you know, the, the internet has so many expressions and, and creating videos, but you know, media, media kind of work to leave, uh, leave as much as I've learned uh, behind me that I possibly can. That's really what excites me. Oh, that's so awesome. I'm so excited about that. And, you know, it is such an honor to connect with you today. And um, I know that there are so many astrology lovers that tune into this show and just quite a, an exciting treat to get to hear from you. And I'd love to know if there's any, you know, final words of wisdom that you'd like to share for all of us, you know, as we continue navigating our charts. Yeah, well, Obviously, the world is, uh, you know, has come to a, a dangerous precipice. You know, we seem to be going headlong into some kind of black hole at this point. Um, that's what it looks like. I believe strongly that we can create a livable human future. I, I think the seeds of that are already obvious. Uh, anybody who hasn't lost faith in the human future, you know, is a friend of mine, as far as I'm concerned. I uh, teach a program sometimes called Generations, and it's a kind of complicated subject, but watching the world change astrologically, the age of Aquarius that we're in now, I think the age of individuality, a kind of post-national uh, post age, you know, what that will mean, the age of the single person, not that marriage will disappear, but a huge respect for individuality. And uh, the, the line I use in that program, which should kind of be my final word here, 
is trust the children, to trust the children. Mm. And the, the notion is, uh, you know, I, I, I think of my grandparents' generation and, uh, and their children were, you know, like flappers in the 1920s and, you know, listening to jazz music and hanging out with brown people and, you know, and, and, and the grandparents, great grandparents were all, oh my God, this is terrible. This is the end of the world. They didn't trust their children. But those kids who are now ancient or dead, you know, they knew what they were doing. And then, you know, I, I came up through the hippies, you know, and, and it's like, we're, we're doing all these things like living together and taking psychedelic drugs and, and you know, listening to weird music. And, and you know, that worked, that worked. Uh, David Crosby, Crosby, Stills and Nash once said, we got everything right, except the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> And I think he about nailed it. I think he nailed it with that, you know, so the hippies, you know, I, I mean, that's an archaic word now, but it's like, we should have been trusted. You know, we're, we're creating something. And, and now, you know, I, people my age or probably even your age, these kids today, they're just looking at their cell phones. They're not relating to each other, you know, <laughs> and, and it's like, don't worry. They're relating to each other. You know, the, trust the children, each generation. We have these huge problems and each generation carries us another step in the direction of the answer. So trust the children. I, I can't think of better words to finish with. Love that. Thank you so, so much. Welcome. Thank you, Emily.